Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Justin Sharp. I uh, have my own small consultancy in Portland, Oregon called Sharply Focused. Um, I think many of you in the room know me, but uh, welcome to those that don't. Um, this session is on weather and climate. Um, if uh, you were here for John's talk um, a few minutes ago, you'll um, have seen that weather and climate are really central to a lot of the questions associated with long-term load forecasting. So we've got um, four experts here today who have done a fair amount of work on uh, different uh, data sets for weather and climate. Uh, three of them are virtual. And then we have Grant Buster here on the stage. Um, I'm going to try and keep all the presentations to 20 minutes so that we have lots of time for a robust discussion. We don't have to cut things off. Um, so without further ado, um, I will uh, introduce Laurent Dubas, um, who works for RTE, uh, is a senior um, scientist there. Um, and uh, he is going to um, give a presentation on RTE's approach to forward-looking weather data. And I see he's online, so take it away, Laurent. Thank you, Justin, and uh, good morning, everybody. I'm gonna try to share my screen. Uh, okay. Can you please just confirm you can see the uh, presentation in full mode? Yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm indeed working with the uh, research and development division of RTE, which is the French transmission system operator. And I'm going to yeah present you how we deal with uh, climate data in our prospective study. So mainly for long-term resource adequacy assessment. Um, I could have presented also aspects on resilience of the assets. But I, I will focus on adequacy assessment today. Uh, and by the way, so thank you for the organizers to in, for inviting me to this uh, to this session. Uh, so the outline of the uh, of the talk would be this one. I try to move that thing. Yeah, I hope you don't see the uh, this. Uh, so I will just give a very brief introduction on the problem of climate change. Then I will uh, describe you in a few slides what we did uh, in the last two or three years uh, about long-term resource adequacy assessments with our uh, report Energy Pathways to 2050. And then uh, uh, describe you what we are working on at the moment to go. Step Laurent, further. sorry, sorry to interrupt yes. you for a second. Could you yeah. move as close to your mic as possible? You're fairly quiet. Oh, okay. I am using headphones. Maybe that's the problem. Is it better now? A little bit, yes. Okay. I try to speak loud. So, what is the problem? Uh, as you probably all know. Uh, climate change uh, can't be considered as an opinion. It's a fact, it's a scientific fact. It has been proven by IPCC many times and it has been reinforced uh, in the latest report, which, which was published last year. Uh, and the other fact is that climate change is due, is due uh, mainly uh, to uh, human activities, uh, essentially coming from the, uh, the burning of, of fossil fuels, so coal, gas, and, and oil. Uh, we can't uh, we can't neglect that. It's very important. We are already seeing many changes all over the world. And if you uh, just want some examples, I put just two there. The first one is about the uh, Pacific North American heat wave that you experienced, guys, in in June 2021. Uh, here on the on the left plot, you can see the, uh, the, the the large geographical spread of that heat wave. Uh, which impacted uh, uh, British Columbia in particular, and that, so the west of, uh, of Canada and, uh, and North America. And uh, the, the right plot shows the uh, historical observations in gray, and the red dots are for this uh, specific event in, in June 2021. And you can uh, just see that the uh, heat wave was very, very intense, uh, with record temperatures beating by more than 9 degrees Celsius, uh, the historical uh, records. Similarly, in Europe last year, in July 2022, we had a very hot summer. In fact, the, the, the European summer of 2022 was the, uh, the hottest ever recorded. Uh, it was particularly strong in France, uh, where again, the year 2022 was the warmest on record. And uh, uh, it looks like the, uh, the, the coming years will be uh, maybe, maybe similar to that. And uh, uh, this kind of uh, event, our very hot summer may become the norm uh, by 2040 or 2050, unfortunately. So climate change is there. 
uh, not only heat waves, but also other extreme events that need to be taken into consideration uh, when we are uh, talking about dimensioning our power system. So the uh, power network itself, uh, not only in France, but I guess everywhere, uh, is dependent on weather and climate for all the aspects of the activities. Uh, so the first one uh, we work on on our side is the uh, supply demand balance of the resource adequacy assessment on different timescales. Uh, but it's also about network resilience. So the resilience of the assets to uh, climate change, to changing conditions, uh, new extremes, more extremes, and so on. Uh, so like I said, today I will, I will uh, focus on the uh, supply demand balance problem, uh, but we also work on network resilience. And so uh, the main point is that climate change on the one side and the uh, renewable energy sources development uh, will increase the dependence of the power system to uh, climate data and to climate change and climate viability. And so climate change really needs to be taken into account uh, in any prospective studies. So what is it about when I talk about uh, uh, resource adequacy assessment? So this energy pathways to 2050, uh, for which you can find the executive summary in English on our website, Unfortunately, it's not the full report, which is available in English, but uh, you already have the, uh, the summary. Um, it's a comprehensive modeling and an extensive analysis, which is uh, required by the uh, French authorities. Uh, it is based on the uh, international European and French objectives uh, and policies uh, in order to reach the decarbonation target by 2050. Um, it is a complete system uh, modeling on the different energy mix scenarios and uh, different uh, consumption tra trajectories. And uh, to our knowledge, it's the first, the first uh, study of its kind to include climate change uh, considerations in the way and in the extent uh, we did, and I, which I will explain in a minute. So basically the, uh, the idea of the model is that we consider uh, climate information, uh, thermal units availability, uh, renewable energy generation time series, consumption time series, flexibility, sectoral coping, and so on. Uh, we introduce all that in a simulation tool of the power system, which is called Antares, which is an open source tool, by the way. Uh, and then we can we can study different different uh, aspects of the of the power system, and in the end we get a lot of indicators, a lot of results. Uh, addressing uh, the uh, the needs for network reinforcement, for instance, or interconnections uh, development. Uh, we have figures and, and results about energy balances, uh, flexibility needs, uh, complete system cost, investment uh, needs and cost, but also about environmental aspects like CO2 emissions, raw material consumptions, uh, solar artificial artificialization, sorry for the pronunciation, and nuclear waste and many, many, many other things. So at the uh, very beginning of the chain, you can see that we, we need climate database to, uh, to uh, simulate what consumption and production might be. And for that, we used uh, climate projections and climate simulations. Uh, I will come back to that in a, in a minute. So in this um, exercise, so we studied different consumption trajectories based on the uh, long-term policy uh, targets. So we had a baseline scenario, which was for 645 terawatt hours uh, per year at the horizon of 2050, knowing that uh, currently it's about 450 uh, terawatt, terawatt hours. But we also have some variance uh, with uh, either uh, lower or higher consumption, depending on the, on the um, exact evolution of the economy. Uh, similarly, we have uh, studied six different generation mix scenarios. So it's a very small and you can't read, I'm sorry, but uh, basically we have two families of such scenarios. Uh, for the first three of them, um, we do not consider any new nuclear reactor, but uh, rather a very strong development of renewable, renewable energy sources uh, with a different uh, ratio between onshore and offshore wind and uh, solar PD. And in the, the other family, uh, we considered the, uh, the development of new nuclear power plants of new generation uh, with a viable number of, uh, of nuclear plants from 6 to 14. And so all these combinations of scenarios, so six generation scenarios times three uh, consumption scenarios were analyzed uh, after, after the simulations were made. So if we come back to the, uh, to the climate data, um, our current approach 
is based on uh, climate simulations made by Meteo France, which is our national net service. Uh, those simulations are a little specific considered uh, uh, with respect to, to, to what you are maybe familiar with, uh, because we considered what they call uh, constant climate simulations. In practice, it's not constant climate, but constant CO2 forcing. So basically we have uh, three sets of 200 climate years, which are representative of the years 2000 on the one side and of the years 2015, uh, 2050, sorry, on the, on the other side with both scenarios. So emission scenarios, RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5. So basically the uh, RCP 4.5 is the uh, more or less the uh, trajectory we are following at the moment. Uh, with uh, CO2 emissions, which are stronger than what should be the target to, to fulfill the Paris Agreement. And the RCP 8.5 scenario is really the worst case scenario, uh, which uh, drives us toward uh, uh, an, an, a world in which we can't live anymore, I think. So basically, uh, Metro France simulated the whole of Europe. Uh, you can see the map on the, on the right side. Uh, for uh, those three sets of 200 years, we have hourly resolution and 20 kilometers resolution. And in the end, we have uh, data uh, on, on this grid and that with those resolutions uh, for both air temperature, cloud, cloud cover, wind speeds up 10 and 100 meters, solar irradiance, precipitation, and river flow. River flow is only available about France, but it's available there. And uh, that is the, the basic data set we use for those, for those uh, simulations of the power system in combination with the energy mix scenarios and the consumption scenarios. So you can see that, uh, like I said, according to us, it's the first time such a comprehensive data set for climate evolution has been taken into account in such a, in such a study. So from climate to energy, what we do, of course, is that we convert uh, the weather variables to energy variables. Uh, so, for instance, demand is computed from cloud cover and temperature, and uh, wind power is computed from wind speed, and, and so on and so forth. And in the end, we have uh, uh, our 200 years times three uh, data sets uh, for all uh, the input variables that are needed to generate to to simulate the uh, the evolution and the behavior of the power system. I'm going to now present some results uh, of what it gives. Uh, so basically, here you have the effect on uh, eating uh, consumption and uh, uh, cooling and ventilation consumption. Uh, and for um, each plot, you have the, uh, the uh, current uh, consumption for the current climate. Uh, for instance, it's uh, something like 55 terawatt, terawatt hours uh, for, for eating. And you can see that with uh, increasing temperature in the future, uh, of course, the heating need will, re will be reduced uh, slightly more for RCP 0.5 than for uh, RCP 4.5. And uh, uh, inversely, uh, the need of cooling and ventilation uh, energy will increase, uh, not linearly, but uh, in, in proportion to the, uh, to the emission scenario and to the increase in temperature globally. Uh, if we look more specifically at uh, heat waves and cold waves, so the uh, the left plots, so heat waves on the top and cold waves on the on the bottom, just show you uh, some yeah bubble plots of the uh, evolution of the intensity and the and the duration of uh, cold spell and and heat waves. Uh, so the uh, blue dots are for the current climate, and the uh, orange dots are for the RCP 4.5 uh, case. So you can see that uh, uh, on the uh, on the on the bottom side you have a, a decrease in the intensity and the frequency of uh, cold waves, and inversely you have a, a very strong increase in the intensity and uh, duration of the heat waves. Uh, when this is converted to load to demand, of course the effect is that uh, we see a decrease of heating needs and an increase in cooling needs. Uh, what we what we saw in practice is that the uh, overall effect is not extremely important. It's only a few terawatt hours, I think. So a small proportion of the total consumption, uh, but it means that the, uh, the seasonality, the seasonal cycle of demand is changed quite significantly. Uh, I will go briefly through the, uh, through the other results because we are here mainly talking about the load in this, in, this, uh, in this session, but I think it's interesting to look at the other results as well. 
so here you have a, a map for the uh, wet period and the dry period uh, changes in uh, hydro power capacity. Uh, and what you can see is that uh, overall from December to May, which is the wet period in France, uh, there will be a, a slight increase in the uh, hydro power capacity. Whereas in the uh, already dry period, so summer and, and, and autumn, uh, there will be a, a decrease in the, uh, in the hydro power generation capacity. So overall, again, the change is not very important. It's a slight decrease, but the seasonality of the, of the hydro power capacity production generation uh, is uh, quite significantly impacted. And I have to say that the, those, uh, those uh, projections uh, are probably too, too optimistic because the uh, hydrological model that was used uh, is not uh, is not the best one, and uh, then work is ongoing to to improve and to compare with other hydrological models. On the uh, uh, wind and solar generation side, uh, from those data sets, we don't see a major impact of climate change on the uh, load factors for wind and and, and solar PV. Uh, basically, the changes are. Um, quite marginal and they are at least one other magnitude smaller than the uh, internal viability that we can also already uh, already uh, see today uh, and so the uh, the uncertainties mainly come from the uh, technical technological changes and evolutions that will uh, that will happen on those on those industries rather than on the climate itself um we also uh, confirm that uh, if we consider not a single country or a region in, the, in, in France, for instance, on the left side of the, of the plots, uh, where we represent the numbers of our in winter, where the, uh, the load factor is, uh, is smaller than 15% or 10% or 5% or 3%, which are the color bars. Uh, basically, the larger the region you consider, so for instance, on the left side, on the right side, sorry, you have a France plus Germany plus Spain plus uh, United Kingdom. Uh, then the number of uh, occurrences of uh, events with low wind uh, are, are, is, uh, is lower, uh, which means that there is some uh, compensation of, um, of low wind speeds at uh, the scale of the continent. So the larger the uh, interconnection system is, uh, the better it is to face wind droughts. Uh, here you have some two maps of one specific day during which the uh, resource adequacy can, can't be assured uh, because there's more consumption than generation. So we, we uh, analyzed this extensively. And uh, what we found is that uh, overall, uh, the uh, difficult days in the future uh, will change in nature compared to uh, what we have today. Uh, you may know that currently in France, uh, the, uh, the, the difficult days for the uh, balance between supply and demand are due to very cold waves in winter because we have a lot of electric heating in the country. Uh, so basically the risks are mainly in January and February, which are the coldest months in France. Uh, and uh, due both to the increase in temperature in the future and to the increase in the wind power installed capacity, uh, the risk will change in nature, uh, so it will go from extreme cold in January, February to a combination of cold waves and wind droughts uh, in, a longer, in a longer time frame. So basically from October to March, uh, so we will be uh, uh, less prone to extreme, uh, extreme cold temperature because there will be less uh, cold waves, uh, but we will be more exposed to those situations where we have relative cold over France or over Europe and associated with wind droughts uh, generated over, over um, um, generalized sorry, over France and, and the surrounding countries. So the nature of the risk would change. And uh, this is very important to take into account in our, in our perspective. So uh, this is what we did until last year. And what's next? Um, first, we need to notice that we have some limits uh, to our current approach. So um, we use, for instance, one single climate model. Uh, overall, the analysis we did uh, by comparing it to uh, um, multimodal ensemble shows that uh, it's overall a good one. It's a good model. Uh, it is in the uh, average of the uh, response to climate change uh, compared to the ensemble. Uh, but of course, as a single model, it does not cover the full climate response spectrum that you can see when you consider several models. 
And the second aspect is that it's based on uh, yeah previous IPCC report cycle, so semip six models uh, from the 20, 2012 to 2014, 2012 to 2014, sorry. So it's quite an old model and new models have been, uh, have been uh, provided since then and they are a priori better uh, in representing the evolution of climate. Uh, the other limitation is that this model was used for fixed time horizons, so 2000s and 2050. Uh, so more or less, we can say it's representative of 2040 to 2050, 2060. Uh, so it's nice if we, and it's adequate if we want to look at this target time horizon, uh, but it's not adequate uh, to study longer term evolution of the climate impacts. And in particular for our, our, our resilience studies, where we want to assess the impact of climate change on our uh, power lines or power stations until the end of the century, uh, then this, this kind of uh, climate data is not adequate at all. And last but not least, uh, this is not public data. So there's some lack of transparency and replicability. And uh, it's something that has been uh, requested in our public consultations to work with uh, more open data, uh, which, can be, uh, which can be also used by, uh, by other actors. So uh, our next target uh, is to try to overcome all these issues. Uh, so yeah, just here remember currently what you are using. Similarly at ENSO Edible, so ENSO is the uh, European Association of uh, TSOs. Uh, they use currently historical data based on uh, reanalysis, so more or less the uh, 45 last years. And they also want to take climate change into account and uh, to use climate protection. So, we have some convergence of the EU approach and our uh, national approach. And basically the idea is to switch from one model to multiple multi-models um, to consider different in, uh, emission scenarios. Uh, for instance, the new IPCC scenario, so SSP uh, 2.6 or levels of warming, 1.5 degree to 2 degree and so on. So the latest um, science available from IPCC. Uh, we also want to include the temporal dynamics uh, just in order to be able to take the best climate as I said, depending on the target horizon. And uh, of course, we want to include the, uh, the latest uh, projections available from the CIMIP-6 uh, experiment and uh, also to, to take data in open access. And so for that, uh, we're working both at, at ENSO East uh, level and RT level. Uh, to migrating towards the uh, Coper Copernicus Climate Change Service, which is the European uh, uh, system for providing climate data. Uh, and there's uh, the contract ongoing uh, in, that, uh, in that way. Let me now come to my summary because I think my time is over. So uh, just a few takeaway messages. So first of all, climate change is a reality. It is already there and must be taken into account. Uh, when we do prospective studies and when we design new infrastructure or we want to, to, to refurbish existing ones. Um, both climate change and power systems evolution, in particular with the development of renewable, renewable energies, um, increase the energy system dependence on weather and climate. So it's more and more important to consider those. Energy planning and operations uh, require relevant state of the art and authoritative information about climate. And that's why moving to uh, open source data, open, open access data is important. And uh, last but not least, climate services, so the, the, the provision of uh, data products and guidance from the, from the science community to the uh, energy uh, sector users um, is extremely important. And so the user provider collaboration is really essential to deliver uh, user-driven and science-based information services. Uh, towards our target for the energy transition. With that, I would like to thank you and just make a, a short announcement. Uh, it's still time to register for the uh, ISEM conference, uh, which will be held at the end of June in Italy, uh, which is uh, in particular dedicated to the uh, climate resilient energy system. And I would like to thank you. Um, the next um, speaker is Eric Smith from EPRI. Um, he is uh, a climate resilience analyst, and Eric is going to talk about the climate ready approach uh, to forward looking weather data sets uh, from EPRI. Um, are you able to hear us, Eric? I am. Let me uh, get my right, file shared here. You're coming in loud and clear. And Eric, I'll give you a five minute warning and a one minute warning. 
All right, are you able to see full screen on the PowerPoint? Uh, yes, we are. Perfect. All right, um, yeah, appreciate that, Justin. Really wish I could be there in person, but I'm glad that I was allowed to at least give a talk here remotely. Um, so as Justin said, yeah, we're, we had a, uh, a need or a, for hourly profiles or hourly projected weather. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about our approach to kind of filling this gap. Um, so the, uh, or, and give some, some quick examples on, um, you know, how we did this as well as some validation um, examples here. Um, so to, to jump into the meat of it here. So we need hourly projections. Uh, we need them yesterday. We don't have hourly projections by and large from the majority of climate models. Um, in order to get hourly projections, uh, which are really critical in a lot of power system applications, uh, you have to you know, pay a lot of money to custom dynamically downscale data uh, to get that hourly temporal resolution, um, or you have to employ a, you know, a vast array of other methods. Uh, one method for getting hourly projected data um, is to just interpolate you know, with what the, the climate models give you. So if you are pulling data from the publicly available CMIP6 climate models, um, <clears throat> the values you're gonna have access to are like daily maxes, daily mins, daily means. Um, and you can interpolate between those values, but it ends up looking something like this figure on the left-hand side here, um, where the, the daily interpolation is the orange line and the hourly values is the black line. And, and the gap between those two is shaded in gray. Um, so there's a lot of issues with doing that, especially if you're trying to capture the diurnal temperature cycles um, or diurnal relationships between temperature and other variables. Um, that second example, you know, as I said, dynamically downscaling climate model projections is quite expensive. Um, and you're gener generally limited um, because it's, you know, it costs a lot of money and it's computationally expensive. You're generally limited to one model, maybe two models, one or two uh, projected scenarios. So your, your robustness of data is quite low. <clears throat> the, um, the approach, I guess, that we, we're gonna be talking or I'm talking about here is uh, leveraging historical data, which you have a lot of historical years, you have hourly data, um, and incorporating a lot of different climate model projections and a lot of different scenarios um, to create synthetic hourly profiles. Um, this this uh, approach can be utilized in a lot of different applications. Uh, one that I'm gonna outline is a, a resource adequacy application. Uh, so we had a need a couple of years ago you know, on a project we've been working on um, in a resource adequacy application to uh, create a risk model. So this model is taking in hourly weather data, specifically projections for a future year um, and trying to figure out when the demand might see this exceed the supply. So otherwise, uh, when are you going to have hours or days that are potentially risky based off of changes in technologies? Um, so we took the 72 historical weather years that we had available from the ERA-5 reanalysis data. Um, so this is a gridded reanalysis product that's hourly temporal resolution, about a 30 kilometer spatial resolution, uh, regarded as one of the best um, gridded data products available. Um, but we took those 72 historical years for the points of interest. Um, then we took five climate models and two emission scenarios and applied those to the 72 historical years to essentially generate 720 uh, synthetic 8760 profiles. So 720 uh, years of hourly projection data that we could feed into that risk model. Um, so I'll un unpack just real quickly how we did that. Um, and, and again, talk about some of the important characteristics that we're trying to capture throughout this process. Um, so I think a key is that, you know, in absence of having hourly data, we need to figure out responsible ways um, and good ways of filling those gaps until we have, you know, a large number of dynamically downscaled data sets, um, or as Grant's going to talk about other approaches um, to filling these gaps. So we need to make sure that we're doing our due, due diligence um, throughout the process. Um, but yeah, so this, this process that I'm outlining here, we were able to leverage a lot of key or important characteristics from the historical data, as well as the climate model projections. So the historical data, um, you know, it's, it's really, it's, it's not useless when you think about how the weather might behave in the future. There's a lot of important aspects that we can capture, like the variability, interannual variability, 
day-to-day -day or diurnal variability. Um, <clears throat> that's in the, the historical data, the historical hourly data. And if we're pulling 72 years of historical data, we're gonna get a lot of variability that's gonna be really relevant for future years. Um, however, what's lacking is that we only have historical years. So there's no way of knowing um, if that historical data is gonna capture extreme, like specific extremes. There's, there's likely gonna be extremes that far exceed the historical bounds or the historical data sets. Uh, and we've seen that in, you know, in the Pacific Northwest heat wave, the Texas extreme cold event. Um, a lot of these events were not within that historical record, um, especially the Pacific Northwest heat wave. You didn't see that type of event in the majority of climate models for another 20 or 30 years. So being able to capture those events um, is something that you really need to rely on the projections for. Um, <clears throat> the historical data, another key benefit though, um, and, and the benefits are, are highlighted in green in this table. But another key benefit with that, the historical data, is that it preserves the, the physical link between variables. So you're, you're pretty limited, um, and I'm kind of lumping that bottom row in here too, but you're pretty limited in terms of the number of variables you can get from climate model projections. Um, so, you, you know, dry bulb temperature or, or air temperature, you can sometimes get dew points, humidity, uh, 10 meter wind speeds, solar radiance, and precipitation. Um, that's, the, that's the primary var variables you're gonna see across climate models. Um, you don't have 100 meter wind speeds, but you do in the historical record. Um, and you don't have a lot of other critical variables that you do have in a historical data set like RFI. So those, those being able to have physically consistent at the hourly time scale uh, data sets is really important. So one thing I'll note is that throughout this entire process, all we are um, shifting or what we are creating synthetic profiles of is temperature. So temperature, as well as dew point temperatures is what we applied this to. We're not shifting anything like precipitation or wind or solar, um, because as Laurent said, you know, wind and solar, as we've seen as well, is not projected to change that much. Um, and if you look across different climate models, some could show increases, some can show decreases. So there's not a lot of certainty in the directionality of change of variables like wind and solar. Uh, so we're not shifting those, but they are maintaining that physical consistency between the hourly timestamps because we're using the same uh, data set era five for those variables as well. Uh, so just to quickly touch on the, the variables, um, we're working with the era five data. Um, so that's, and when we did this um, example or the study was 72 years of data. So 1950 through 2021, era five actually has been extended back through 1940. Um, and obviously they, they, they stay updated pretty, pretty close to uh, current few, few days to weeks behind the present day. Um, the projected data is from five CMIP-6 climate models. So CMIP-6 is the latest generation of climate models. Uh, the the uh, inter-comparison project we pulled from was the ISI MIP or ISI MIP project. Uh, we pulled two specific emission scenarios. So a plausible lower bound or SSB-126 and a plausible upper bound. So SSB-370 um, as our higher emission scenario. Um, and th this data is available for the entire globe. Um, so you could, you could run this or repeat this analysis for anywhere. Uh, same with the ERA-5 data, it's available. It's a global data set. Um, but the four steps we use to, to create these synthetic data sets um, are one, to spatially bias correct the coarse climate model projections. So we um, essentially are getting those into the same resolution and bias correcting. Um, we're getting them into the same resolution as the ERA-5 data as well as bias correcting some of the uh, uh, biases. Um, we detrend the historical era five data. So we don't want to preserve trends in the historical data. What we wanna do is kind of level the historical data so that what we're capturing is natural variability and not a climate trend. Um, that's important at, you know, steps three and four um, because we are essentially applying the trend from the climate models to the 72 years of data. Uh, so we wanna remove any historical trend before we apply, apply the climate model um, trends to that data. Um, and in order to apply the climate model trends to those um, hourly data sets, we are um, calculating the distributional shift in the different climate models. Um, so we're calculating that shift between the historical climate model simulations and the projected uh, data in the cl same climate model um, and applying that delta to the historical era five hourly data. Um, a little bit more specifically, we are using a quantile delta mapping approach uh, and we're doing it on a monthly scale so that you can capture different deltas by season. Um, and then on the right-hand side, we apply that to the, the ERA-5 data 
Um, and it's small, but that kind of gives you an idea of the black dash line is the original uh, smooth 8760 for uh, sample year 2015. And the other colored lines are how that year gets shifted. And you can see there's differences. So the deltas are different depending on the time of year. It's not a simple one degree Celsius or two degree Celsius delta being applied across uh, the entire time series. So to step through a few um, examples, especially in terms of validation and understanding how that, that method works and what the resulting data looks like. Um, this example shows the cumulative distribution function for uh, one, the historical data. So it's, it's not the gray bar, it's actually the black line here. Uh, but the historical era five hourly uh, cumulative distribution functions, the black line, uh, the synthetic projections is the orange line and the climate model data is the green line. So what we wanna see is that the green and the orange lines overlap pretty well. We wanna see that our synthetic data created from the hourly historical data is able to align with the, the raw climate model projections. Uh, but more importantly, we wanna make sure that the extremes or the tails look good too, right? Um, so zooming in on the, the cold tails, the synthetic data actually captures more extreme cold um, than the climate model projections, which uh, feels a good thing, especially if you're using this in a stress testing uh, situation. But Looking at the, the warm tail, it is very close to the raw climate model projections too. So it's capturing the extremes as well as the overall cumulative distribution function here um, for this particular site, as well as uh, all the other sites that we looked at. <clears throat> so tangibly, you know, I think distributions are, are something that people look at a lot. Um, so we had five climate models, uh, but I'm showing you the, the cold model and the warmer model in this case, um, and how the historical distribution. So the historical distributions um, are the, um, the, the thatched uh, distribution. The projections are the color distributions. So the top is um, for the lower climate scenario and the orange or the bottom row is for the higher climate scenario. Uh, but you can see how the different uh, climate models result in different shifts in the distribution. So um, a plus 2% increase in the days above the historical 95th percentile based on the colder model. But looking at the warmer model, that's actually 7% increase in the days above the historical 95th percentile or this light red dashed line there. Um, so another way of thinking about this is what if we took a historical year, so a historical 8760 and shifted that to a future year, and in this case, 2050. Um, so taking that and shifting it based on two different scenarios, so SSP 126 or our lower scenario in orange, and SSP uh, 370 or our higher scenario in red, um, you can see how the number of hours that exceeded a particular temperature threshold, in this case, 100 degrees Fahrenheit um, in the month of July, um, I think this was for Atlanta. But if you shift this based on the lower climate scenario, you now have 25 hours above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if you shift it for the even higher scenario, so SSP 370, um, you have 34 hours above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so this can show you how that, that looks in terms of representing extremes. Um, this example is meant to call out um, or, or provide a better idea of what detraining the data does. So um, if you take a, a historical year, if you think about a historical year like 19, uh, or we'll use the example here, 1980. So 1980 had a pretty hot September, um, but it wasn't as hot or it wasn't as hot as 2016 uh, because 2016 um, had a few decades of, of warming kind of baked into the year. Um, but if you remove that warming signal and you're only looking at natural variability um, and you put those kind of on a level playing field, 1980 was actually more extreme than 2016 from a natural variability standpoint. Um, and that, sh that stands out as you look at what shifting uh, those years uh, does to the, the, the data here. So 1980 gets shifted a lot more than 2016. Um, when you apply that to, to the year 2050. Um, one more point I guess to make here uh, before I wrap up is that the, this method allows for a lot of flexibility in terms of adding a lot of synthetic years. So more synthetic years captures more extremes. So the, the dots or the tails of these box plots are important here. So as you add more years, the red uh, box plots compared to the green box plots, um, you're able to really flex those tails, stress test more. Um, so you can see more events that are, are more extreme on the cold side as well as the warm side um, in a lot of months. Not always the case, like fall, for whatever reason, the um, historical data tends to stay colder than the projected data, even though you're adding 
more scenarios to the data set, but um, adding more years allows you to flex and stress test um, a lot more. So to wrap up, um, the, the main motivation for this is that we, we need hourly projections for a lot of power system applications. We don't have that, so we need a way to create that. Um, there's a lot of benefits to, the current, to this approach. It's very simple, it's very quick to run. Um, it can be done and we're, we're doing it in Python, so it can be turned into a really um, easy to use open source application. Um, it leverages real world variability from historical data, lots of historical data, and allows you to create thousands of realistic climate adjusted profiles based on the number of models and scenarios you wanna um, loop into that. It preserves the physical link between variables. So no need to jump between models or different, different modeling um, institutes to pull the variables that you need. Um, you can get all those variables from the same data set, ERA-5, and just adjust uh, the temperature data, uh, which is often the primary variable that you need to think about adjusting anyway. Um, and just to call out a few limitations. So this, this is done on points. So we, we don't have a way, um, and we haven't validated how this works spatially. So we apply this to specific points, specific load centers. Um, and, and that's just how we've done it so far. Uh, we primarily do this just for temperature, like dew point temperature. I wouldn't advise applying this to, to precipitation or winds because um, you can in, introduce a lot of issues there. Um, and I, I mentioned this earlier that, you know, you can't capture extremes that are far beyond the historical record. So even by removing the trend and adjusting um, or pulling out the historical trend uh, and trying to capture those naturally um, extreme years, uh, there's going to be a lot of events or events like the Pacific Northwest heat wave that just don't show up even in the synthetic data. Um, though I could, you know, pose the question of, of whether or not you would even plan for some of these black swan events anyway, um, if those events were in the data. Um, but yeah, so I'll, I'll pause there or I guess I'll, I'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much for that really interesting talk, Eric. Um, the next uh, talk actually dovetails nicely into some of the stuff that Eric's been talking about and again is looking at um, some of the issues with um, taking climate models and uh, being able to get that hourly output that's needed by our sector. Um, so our next speaker is actually uh, live here, which means I have to pull up his presentation. The chair actually has to do a job. And um, Okay. Okay, you got it. Um, so um, Grant's talk is uh, entitled uh, Super Resolution for Renewable Energy Resource Data with Climate Change Impacts Using Generative Machine Learning. Uh, Grant is a data scientist at NREL. I've had the pleasure of working with him on, um, on a, a major project on um, extreme weather. Um, and he's a super smart guy. And so I will let him tell you all about generative machine learning, which I think is possibly a really important uh, new method uh, going forward for our sector. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, can you hear me okay? Cool. Uh, I kind of changed the name of the presentation last minute, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, my name is Grant. I work at NREL. Um, I do data stuff. Today, I'm going to be talking about this new data set, uh, new generative machine learning models that we're developing, generally called SuperCC, and I'll, I'll define that acronym in a second. Um, a lot of this material is preliminary. Um, we have released the data, but a lot of these findings are, are still preliminary, so just caveat. Um, so at NREL, we do a lot of really big renewable energy integration studies. So um, you might have heard about the NREL SEAM study that Josh led. Um, LA100 study is maybe the most recent. Um, National Transmission Planning Study is kind of the current big one. Um, and then the, the study that Justin actually alluded to is in the, in the middle bottom, the evolving role of extreme weather with high renewables, uh, high renewable systems. Um, for most of these studies, they've all relied on historical weather and been planning for a future grid. So there's a bit of irony here where you're planning for a grid in 2050, but using weather for maybe, let's say, 2010. Uh, so that's not maybe a great assumption, and we've been working on that. Um, it's a really hard assumption to kind of chisel away at. Um, and this presentation will kind of get into uh, some progress we made on that front. So how do these projects fit together? Generally, we have this renewable energy resource data, this meteorological data. We usually use the NSRDB, National Solar Radiation Database, and Wind Toolkit. Um, that feeds into REV, which produces power generation profiles um, and goes into our whole power system modeling ecosystem toolkit. 
And we also have low data on the side as well. So energy demand, electrified futures, et cetera. Um, what we're proposing here is to integrate a new data set, um, very similar to what Eric was doing, is doing, um, where we have a new climate change data set that kind of uh, kind of a hot swap with the, the traditional historical uh, renewable energy resource data and also adjust the, the energy demand data. So um, you've, you know, Eric has kind of alluded to this as well. Uh, there's this big gap between climate models and our mesoscale data sets that we like for um, renewable energy applications. Uh, global climate models, typically 100 kilometer, daily average, uh, really long time period. Our mesoscale data sets are really uh, two to four kilometer and um, hourly at, at a minimum. Um, and you really need this high resolution to characterize wind variability, solar variability, um, things like that. And so there's a few, you know, traditional solutions to, to address this challenge. Um, they've been alluded to dynamical downscaling. It's, uh, you know, the gold standard, but very computationally expensive and difficult to characterize a lot of different climate features and statistical downscaling, similar to what Eric is doing, um, which is great, computationally efficient, but has generally has trade-offs with uh, spatiotemporal consistency and capturing the full range of, of possible climate futures. So we've been introducing a, a, a new method, new set of methods called uh, super resolution for renewable energy resource data with climate change impacts or super CC. And so we're using generative machine learning here. Um, you can kind of think of it like chat GPT where you, know, you tell chat GPT, give me a poem and it spits out all this information. Uh, here you're giving it this low resolution uh, uh, climate data, which is you can see on the bottom left, this kind of really blocky low resolution daily data. And it's generating the synthetic uh, hourly four kilometer, um, in this case, wind field that um, is maybe not perfectly accurate, but is very realistic and physically consistent across space and time. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to this approach. It's, it's really computational efficient, computationally efficient, uh, one to two orders of magnitude faster than traditional dynamical downscaling with a weather model. Um, it's designed specifically for renewables, so wind, solar, temperature, humidity. Um, and because of that, it's fully integrated and fully integrated into all of our renewable energy analysis software. So all the open source software that Enrel puts out, this data is just plug and play. Um, and it's all open source. So feel free to go check out that code if you um, have an appetite for it. So this is what it looks like kind of at a larger scale. Um, we've, we've scaled it up and we've produced our first initial data set. So you have temperature on the top, wind speed in the middle, and solar radiance on the bottom. And then on the left-hand column, you have the, the daily average GCM data. And then on the right, you have the super resolved high resolution data. Um, and what I really like about this animation is you can see this uh, kind of low temperature, high wind speed weather event kind of curling in in the, in the central US, um, bringing with it a, cl a cloud system as well. Um, and it kind of illustrates that you know all these data sets, all these variables are um, uh, spatiotemporally coincident or spatiotemporally coherent. You know, it preserves the physicality across all the variables. Um, you're going to see these weather patterns come in uh, that that you know are physically realistic. Um, we've we've released an initial data set. So right now it's just 20 years from one uh, climate scenario, and you you can see the the Open Energy Data Initiative link below. Um, this is really just kind of a demonstration data set right now. We're going to go well beyond 20 years. I'm actually proposing some uh, research funding for that tomorrow, um, but we we do plan to expand this. And, and really, the vision of this is to create, um, you know, hopefully hundreds of years of data, all at a fraction of the cost of traditional dynamical downscaling. Um, it's not just pretty animations. I, I love the animations, but uh, we've done extensive validation, um, verification, validation, and bias correction. Um, these figures are probably kind of hard to see from from the back of the room, but uh, you know, we have 50, 50 pages of these validation plots. Um, and the bottom line is that these data sets look really good. Um, on the bottom left, you can see the, um, some turbulence, uh, turbulence statistics, and you can see that's creating um, wind data that is physically realistic. And on the, on the right, you can see uh, probably probability distributions of wind, solar, and temperature at various, um, in various states. And uh, they all match uh, current historical uh, state-of-the-art data sets. So we're really excited about this data set. It's, it's looking like it'll be very reliable. 
So bring this to load, um, we've been working with Evolved Energy Research and their annual decarbonization perspective. Um, I think I saw Ryan Jones on the schedule, actually. I don't know if I see him here, but uh, Evolved Energy Research puts out a great um, product, the ADP, and we've been using a net zero by 2050 um, scenario. And what I've done is basically taken this data and then uh, subsector by subsector um, created this these adjustment factors that will scale this hourly low data to, to new meteorology, this climate change impacted meteorology to look at these effects. And I, I should say we've we've held everything constant at 2050 infrastructure except for this meteorology assumption, right? So um, there's a fixed number of heat pumps, there's a fixed number of EVs, everything's held constant. We're just looking at how does load change between uh, you know 2010 weather versus 2050 weather? And so here you can see the state by state impact on uh, peak summer AC load on the left and peak winter heating load on the right. Um, you can see a lot of spatial variability. Once again, we're only comparing about 10 years historic to 10 years future. So there's still a lot of uh, noise to the signal, but generally you can see um, pretty wide scale in increases in peak summer AC load and relatively wide scale impacts and uh, decreases in peak winter heating load although there are some states in the, in the Northwest that have uh, appear to have extreme uh, winter events. Uh, it, get, it becomes less dramatic when you look at uh, total peak load, not just um, HVAC. And once again, you know, the signal to noise ratio is not so good when you're just looking at 10 years of data. Um, but one thing I wanna call out here is, is this uh, Arizona peak winter total load. So you're seeing a 40% a increase in, in peak winter load in Arizona. And when I first saw this, I was like, oh, no, we, we got everything wrong. We messed up the data. This, this can't be right. This is, this is uh, kind of an outstander, right? Um, this is what the historical 2007 through 2013 uh, reanalysis data looks like. Uh, the temperature profiles um, is population weighted in Arizona. And just for reference, um, the 1895 to present uh, NOAA record for Phoenix um, the high is 100 Fahrenheit, 37.7 Celsius um, for uh, February and March. And so it captures that pretty well, the 2007 through 2013. And then this is what the 2050 to 2059 <clears throat> time series looks like. And you can see this just completely unprecedented um, heat wave at the end of February, early March. Um, it's about five sigma hotter than the historical record. And, and the standard deviations kind of lose meaning when you're talking about this kind of change in distribution, but just to give you kind of a, a magnitude of scale, it's about, you know, 10 degrees Celsius hotter, pretty significant. Um, now, one thing I, you know, want to caveat and I will keep caveating is this is not like the future. This is just a possible future. A lot of uncertainty in this, but these are the kinds of things we need to start thinking about if we're going to plan for an energy system in 2050 that is resilient to climate change. Um, and we're able to do that. You know, we, we don't just look at this low data. We can also simulate this event uh, with wind and solar power generation. So this is the actual event from that uh, 2050, 2051 uh, weather day. Um, you can see this kind of extreme heat wave coming in the Southwest. Um, solar resource is pretty good. Wind resource uh, medium, I would say, you know, we have to run through our power system models. Um, but the, the bottom line here is that Super CC really enables enables us to identify these high impact events, um, quickly create high resolution data, and then plug them into our power system models. Um, so disclaimers and summary, uh, these results are preliminary and don't quantify many important uh, factors. I don't think you can see the, the preliminary band that was across my slides most of the time, but you know, I wanna understate that. We haven't quantified the uncertainty across many climate models, scenarios, years. Uh, we really want to do that. We're looking for funding to do that. Um, and we can with this uh, super, CC, super CC model. Um, it can plug into virtually any climate model from the CMIP-6 archive. So we're, we're really ready and we have the capabilities to do this. We just haven't yet. Um, it doesn't consider some nonlinearities in energy demand, like people going out and buying window unit AC uh, AC units um, during extreme heat events, those are, you know, very difficult to predict. Um, also population dynamics, you know, this doesn't consider any sort of climate migration or anything under 2050 conditions. Um, but what can you do with this? Um, you know, once again, this is not the future, this is just a possible future. This is really just a tool to explore what the range of possible uh, futures could look like and what we should 
start thinking about planning for. Um, I really think we should consider a wide range of climate features and how they impact on, you know, not just one part of the economy or not one, just one part of the energy sector, but wind, solar load. Um, we're working on hydro as well. And, you know, once again, we, we're really excited about this super CC uh, data and tool set. Um, it's a really great capability that we can use to rapidly integrate these climate features into our power system uh, system models. So, yeah. Um, thank you so much for your time. Uh, there's my email. Um, also, the data is available on OD. So if you want to go download it and poke around, feel free. Um, it streams to your laptop VHSDS as well. Um, and then we're, we're uh, the, the documents in review or manuscripts in review, and we're going to hopefully release more years soon. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Grant, for an exciting presentation. I, Grant showed me some of this stuff a little under a year ago, and um, he actually fooled me and uh, made me made me see a, 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 some output and said, which one is the real mesoscale model output and which one's the, uh, the AI, and uh, I got it wrong. So. Um, <laughs> it's always about 50-50. But it is, it, it, well, I'd like to say around that, it is imperative that we validate these data sets, though, because the mesoscale model data also may not be right as well. So anyways, um, moving on to our next speaker. We're um, nicely ahead of time, which means we'll have plenty of space for discussion. Um, the next speaker is virtual again. It's uh, Chris Clack, who... Um, was the uh, CEO of uh, Vibrant Clean Energy. Uh, VCE recently got purchased by um, Patton. Um, so Chris now works for Patton, but um, the title of his talk is um, VCE's approach to forward-looking forecasting and load and renewable, uh, sorry, uh, approach to forward-looking forecasting of load and renewable generation. So Chris, I've already introduced your talk, so I'll just read the, uh, the uh, well, first of all, Chris, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Great, great. So um, Chris's uh, title to his uh, talk is VCE's approach to forward-looking forecast and uh, of load and renewable generation. So take it away, Chris. Uh, thanks, Justin. Uh, I just had to uh, jump and come back just for briefly there. Uh, I am an old face to ESIG, but a new uh, overlords, new owners. Um, I now work for Patent Energy. I just wanted to uh, let people know that. So um, I will sometimes say VCE when I mean my energy system planning group, um, because that's that's who we are now. Um, but uh, Patent Energy is just a, a company that uh, does does development um, and works through um, and sort of trying to uh, build build renewable and transmission uh, assets for the future. So the big project at the moment is Sunzia. Uh, uh, in the Western US, um, along with a few others. So uh, that'll be the last thing about the employer. Um, but what uh, what I'll talk about mostly today is is the way that uh, we or I have thought about uh, weather and climate uh, and how that forces through our model. Uh, the whole model is called Weather Informed Energy Systems. Um, and uh, you'll hear some overlap with uh, what Laurent talked about uh, on the first talk for sure. Um, but we're trying to model the whole energy system uh, and how we connect that together. Um, and so for me, one of the big drivers is how does, that, how does the weather impact and climate impact the transmission, uh, heat rates, uh, power plant, water availability, wind and solar, of, of, of course, um, but also then on, on the demand side too. And so um, my, my kind of thesis comes at it from we're going to be more and more uh, dependent on the weather not just for electricity, but for the whole economy. And so as that share goes up, we should definitely be uh, planning for for how the climate is is clearly going to, to change. Um, so everything uh, in this talk is prefaced with the idea is it's to go into a planning model of sorts, either production cost or capacity expansion. Um, and hopefully I'll touch on a little bit about like the different ways you could use uh, the data. Um, we have the US, which is at three kilometer resolution, five minutely. And then we have the, the global version, which is 30 kilometers an hourly. Um, course of resolution, because we just don't have as much data available to us. Um, and we're sort of building that out. 
uh, and for our climate data, we use CMIPS five and six uh, data um, to to actually feed through into our, our high resolution uh, weather data. Uh, I've tried to just put in bold the different aspects of the model that uh, actually uses uh, the weather sort of in, intensely and and impacts it quite strongly. Um, the other thing that we do in the planning model is is we go through time, and so we start from a historical year. Um, and then we go in one year, typically one, five or 10 year uh, times, what we call investment periods. Um, most of our work now is annual. annual. Um, so for each year um, in, the, in the model, we're either using uh, one, three, 10 or 100 years of weather data uh, with, with or without climate data. And then, and then we push forward to the next one. And so the model is myopic in the sense that it doesn't know that in 20 years, the weather is going to be impacted by climate change, it just knows that this year is, and then it has to adapt as it moves forward. Um, most of this talk is gonna be focused on data sets and how we build those data sets. Um, and when I look at the list of sort of the main data sets in the model, uh, only really buildable areas, um, we don't touch on too much of the climate data, although we are expanding our consideration with that in terms of sea level rise. Um, but also land use change uh, with climate change and how that might change the uh, the buildable area. So um, that's a future project, but at the moment we're not really uh, considering that with the climate change. Uh, we're mostly looking at the generators, the transmission, the demands, um, uh, and then uh, the, the the system as a whole how it responds. Um, <clears throat> so just to start really from a kind of sort of level setting where where the model is is aiming. Um, I've got these three stars, and I've shown this before, but it's it, for me it's really illustrative. Is uh, we have zero by fifty uh, by twenty fifty, which is basically there's no climate change, but we're just electrifying the economy, um, and so we have we need seven point eight petawatt hours roughly, or seventy eight hundred um, uh, terawatt hours. Um, when we compare that to primary energy use, which is in red here, it's a seventy three percent reduction. But if we're looking at productive or end uses or secondary uses, it's 16% down. And so for that, if we if we were managed to do that and there was no climate change, uh, then we'd uh, have a significant downturn in primary energy and, and, a, and a, a moderate downturn in um, uh, consumptive energy. Uh, but for electricity, of course, there's a big increase. Um, if we add climate change in, and we'll talk about that a little bit, uh, we need about 12% more energy, so nearly nine petawatt hours. Um, and then if we step up one further time and um, look further, we can see if we also need fuels because we can't electrify certain things because of climate change, uh, we need another two petawatt hours on top. Um, and so uh, just from a high level, if, if we don't solve climate change fast enough, which we likely won't, uh, we're gonna need a lot more energy on the electricity sector uh, than, than a, lot of, uh, a lot of things are planning for. And here I'm just using an example of the uh, great electric electrification future study to kind of give you a reference point of like how much more energy that is on top of what is already going to be quite a lot of growth just to get to a uh, reasonable amount. Secondary to that is, uh, and Laurent pointed this out beautifully, is, is that the uh, demand profiles will change dramatically. And so this is just uh, an hourly plot. On the left is 2020 demand. Uh, modeled uh, with 2020 weather. On the right is 2050 uh, without climate change added. And this is just how uh, the evolution of the grid will go. And then add 20% on top of that um, in the middle uh, for cooling demands. And so we have this shift both from electrification, but you also have the, the shift from uh, climate change uh, coming in as well. To give you an example, uh, I'm very upset that I can't be in Colorado today. It's my, my home state, as you can tell by my accent. Um, and so the, um, the demand shift up is we have something called conventional demand. Uh, then we have building electrification, transportation, and hydrogen. And so conventional demand includes AC in these plots. And so that's one of the reasons you're seeing that big drive up. But then you have all, all these new demands stacked on top of that. And all those new demands are very sensitive to weather. And therefore, as a corollary, it's very sensitive to the, the climate. Um, and of course, AC is too. Um, so when we look at climate and Colorado and those new demands, 
So on the right here, we do now have climate involved as well. So on the left is 2020 or estimated 2020. And on the right, we've got uh, 2050 with climate change now included and electrification included. And so what we see is a very strong signal, 60% um, more peak demand basically um, in summer, but we also see a, an actual doubling of demand, so 100% increase in winter. Um, uh, and they both need to be created. And so um, just to kind of do the basic um, sort of layout of how we do this or how we think about it is first thing we do is we split the demands into categories. Uh, sort of the biggest ones, conventional demands, we do kind of break that down now, but I, I didn't want to uh, overly burden that. Um, break it down to the sectors, and then we compute the weather influence on each of those categories, along with societal behavior. So a, a good example is temperature obviously impacts space heating and cooling. So does the radiance, so does cloud, but so does insulation, so does building type, but so does how hot people want the house uh, or, or flats. Um, Another example would be uh, driving. People drive more in summer than they do in winter, but you're gonna need more energy in winter than you are in summer to move the vehicle, both because of the cabin, but also because of the, the battery efficiency. Um, so we try and bring the weather impacts onto all those different components. What we then try and do is we calculate the climate adjustments to those weather years for future simulations. Um, and so what we do is we, we quote unquote nudge uh, from a multi-model uh, ensemble of the climate data, um, the historical data that we have. Um, there's benefits and curses to that. Obviously, the benefit is we get higher resolution data um, from it. Uh, the, the downside is, of course, you're kind of uh, not going to get things like, you know, more extreme weather. You're just going to get whatever you got, but duplicated. Um, we don't mind that so much because we also have a 100-year data set, which I'll show. Uh, that goes back to 1836, which is reanalysis, but we use the high resolution rapid refresh for our high resolution modeling. We then use uh, the reanalysis data going back to 1836 for our resource adequacy um, as well. And then we use the climate data going out to 2100 to bring them all together to give us around 400 different uh, weather years per, per simulation uh, investment period. Um, then finally, we create the, the profiles hourly and five minutely and annual demands, uh, spatially uh, down to three kilometers if we want to. Uh, the climate data we use is seven kilometers, uh, but uh, typically we then average that out to county level to try and uh, avoid some of the, uh, the noise that will come in from the climate models. Um, and then finally, what we do is we adjust to our uh, initialization year where we know everything about the grid. Um, so 2020 is an example here. 2020 wasn't a really great year to initialize to because it was weird for lots of reasons, um, uh, but we're going to move closer uh, to, to today as, as time goes on. Um, we create wind and solar data sets as well. So this is the wind uh, for 2021. And then for each individual site, we have uh, the five minute data set um, uh, as well. So we have about a million sites across the US, and then we have 100,000 data points for each site as well. And we have buildable areas um, included in those. So some places you can build, some places you can't. What I like to look at is kind of the, the, the wind speed or wind power change uh, compared to the decadal. Uh, we're building a huge data set here. We've got 11 years at the moment. We're going to make it longer, of course, for the high resolution. Um, but basically, 2021 wasn't particularly windy. So we had a 6% drop um, annual capacity factor compared to the uh, decadal average on land, offshore. Uh, these images are a bit misleading. Uh, we upgraded to the NREL reference uh, turbine in 2018, I think. Um, and so uh, everything looks good offshore pretty much because of because of that change. Uh, we do the same thing for solar. Um, and again, I, I want to reiterate, like this is like the raw resource that we use, and then we adjust it to, uh, to climate, which I'll show in a second. Um, and again, uh, the difference from the mean was that we actually got an increase in solar power, uh, particularly over the Western uh, US in 2021. Um, and so you can detect that. And on the east, you sort of had a reduction. Um, because I don't like just using one data set, and I also would like to have longer data sets, not just into the future, but into the past, uh, we're using this NOAA reanalysis data set. Um, and we again, we 
we use that with the high resolution to get clouds, to get uh, the difficult components that these models are missing, because this is a coarser model uh, and clouds can be tough. We also use uh, the ghost satellites and do, um, I think the new buzzword is machine learning or AI. I, I just call it linear regression um, to kind of calculate um, what the what those aspects should be um, and then run it through the model. And this is kind of a variation on a slide that I've shown many times before, which is as you go to bigger and bigger scales, your variability drops. Um, and so this is what we're showing here. Left is Maryland state, which is quite a small state. Texas is a relatively large state. And then the US is, is uh, bigger. And so we see a drop in those variabilities. When we look at um, the climate change data sets, we try and get as much value out of those as possible. There's a lot of data. It's obviously global. Uh, but there's also a lot of, um, there can be gaps. So we, we, we get hourly data. So we, most of it's daily or monthly. Uh, we then create hourly uh, data. Um, and as a prime example, if I just circle Texas here, 2021, uh, the, the annual average of that was, was slightly negative. Uh, but we all know uh, what happened in, in February 2021. Um, and so the annual average will all, always uh, smooth things out. And that's why we then use the uh, high resolution data. So we kind of saw this intrusion we saw uh, in 2018 when we were putting this model stuff together. We actually predicted that in, in the model uh, a few years ahead of time. And we thought it was a mistake in the model. We, we actually went, spent a long time trying to fix uh, that mistake. But it, it turns out it, it happened in reality. Um, sort of trying to piece these things together now in terms of how that impacts like the input. Uh, what I'm trying to show here in this somewhat busy slide is the change based on a couple of RCP um, scenarios. Um, we also have SSTs, but this is kind of a, uh, things we've shown before, uh, but wanted to be consistent um, with the data that I'm showing. So the top left panel, uh, there's four uh, images for wind. Uh, the top left and bottom left is 2020 based on 2018 weather nudge to 2020 and the different climate. Um, and so you can see the difference between that new year and the reference year. And then the right hand one is to 2050. And so again, these are annual averages. And so you see basically an increase in wind across the um, bread basket of wind states. What you don't see here is that the wind speeds are generally faster, even faster at night, so that you're getting the low level jet uh, being strengthened and slower in the day, but the net is a positive of uh, nearly 20% increase uh, in wind power potential. Solar, you kind of get a bit of the opposite. The Southern states uh, get more uh, solar power, the Northern states less, as cloud formation becomes more of a problem based on the modeling that we've done. Uh, and then the top right, we've got some demand data, um, which I'll expand in a, in a second. I just want to focus a little bit on the bottom. Um, I'm not sure how many other studies have done transmission and heat rates. Um, we started doing this in 2018 for uh, some large utilities that we did this for. Um, and we did it for our zero by 50 study as well, where we actually look at the losses and the ampacity of the transmission lines based on the hourly data and then also the heat rates of the power plants. Um, and now, sort of, if people can sort of keep a mental remembrance of like the 4% for transmission and 2.5% and for heat rates. As we go through, um, I'm going to show some hourly data that kind of shows that how the, the annual averages can really wash things away. So here's an expanded view of the demands that I was talking about. Um, we do have more flexibility in the system based on the new loads that are coming in. Uh, but then what we also have is with the climate change coming in, we're going to see a change in the profiles of what the um, the needs are for the different loads. So the top left is water, the bottom left is conventional, the top right is space, heating, and then the bottom right, which is kind of a, the amalgamation of all of these, is kind of what happens to the demand overall. And this is an annual uh, number. Um, and so what we basically find throughout the years is a swing of around 30% um in in the demand basically uh with the net being more in the winter on on net and then a lot more in the summer so the reason there's more in winter is uh the vehicles um become more difficult uh and also the more demands that are needed because you um you need uh more for the transmission 
as well, as you'll see. Um, here's the transmission uh, again, uh, sort of expanded. I'm sorry, I come out a little bit blurry here, but on the left is the ratings and on the right is the transmission losses. So again, at the bottom, I'm showing that 4% rise by 2050, uh, or rather sort of a 2% a rise by 2040, which is what's in these images here. Um, but what uh, I can see is a 20% rise in losses and a 10% rise in ratings uh, in the winter months. Um, and then I actually see around a 10% drop uh, in the ratings uh, and, and losses um, uh, in the summer months. Um, and that's basically because the climate is sort of exacerbating the existing uh, conditions on the on the lines. Um, again, we we kind of try and push it through all parts of the model. So on the left, we've got heat rates. On the right, we've got water availability. Again, the heat rates are kind of hiding things when you take the averages, but essentially you get a straight line up and to the right because it's mostly affected by temperature. There's also um, noise around uh, precipitation. With water availability, we do make one more sort of adjustment where we do a rolling average over multiple years for precipitation because the, the client models uh, we didn't trust as much. So we kind of uh, tried to smooth out some of the noise because we saw some really big uh, bouncing around uh, for precipitation. So we tried to smooth that out a bit. But but essentially, on average, there's some years a lot more water and some, some years a lot less water. And, and so that makes it more difficult for running a thermal fleet um, or a nuclear fleet uh, as well. And then finally on these pieces, um, the wind again just expanded so you can see it a bit clearer here. Uh, the left is wind, the right is solar. Um, and hopefully you can kind of see that um, what, what the model is saying is it, it's going to be kind of windier in the south east and central plains. Uh, by 2050 if the climate is worse um, and that's normally because there'd be a stronger boundary layer collapse and, and nighttime winds uh, from what we're seeing in the diurnal signals and during the day there's actually uh, less uh, because it's hotter in general so um all that's a kind of a lot of uh, talk around inputs and, and how we do it um and by the way we do have all this on our website so it's available to uh, go and look at the technical details of, of how we do all this um, but for me, I wouldn't be able to, on the top of my head, kind of work out exactly how that all sort of filters through into the model. Um, and so what I'm showing here is a, is a big study we did um, in 2020 that's also on our website um, looking at the value of DERs. Uh, but in that uh, study, we actually did three scenarios where uh, climate was added to other scenarios. And so I've got these kind of somewhat... Um, funky looking ar double arrows pointing at, at different scenarios um but each colored arrow points from the lower one which is the non-climate one to the higher one which will be the climate one uh there's a bunch of other uh, assumptions going on um but the reason i'm i'm pointing this out is that the the lower two the white and yellow uh, double arrows they are just the electricity sector and so uh one response that can happen uh, if there's lots of transmission is we actually see us about the same generation need with climate change uh, we just change the resource mix and we end up polluting more uh, which i think is kind of bad or if there's um not much transmission we see a bigger impact we're at more risk which again um if if people know know me i, I go on about transmission a lot but um that basically without the transmission we're at more risk to climate change basically is what we're seeing uh, but we're seeing around uh, 400 to 500 terawatt hour additional generation need. But the very top one, sort of the pinky purple color, that's where I get a bit more worried uh, because actually we see a 33% increase in the need of generation to get over the transmission losses, but also to get over uh, the, the, the new demands that are coming in just from climate change. So this is just climate change additions uh, when we electrify uh, the economy. Um, and so we need 33% more energy uh, in the electricity sector just for climate change. Uh, and this is RCP 4.5, uh, not uh, 8.5, which would uh, uh, look look crazier. Um, but basically, we just see we see a big uptick in in the in the power needs uh, just for climate change, uh, and it's even bigger when we electrify. That's the main point uh, of what we're saying there. So uh, I shall stop talking now, um, and. Uh, uh, be happy to take questions if there is any.